Welcome to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. I am Dr. John, the guide for your heroic journey towards greater health, success, and most importantly, happiness. And now, on with the show. Hi, this is Dr. John, and I am thrilled to announce that Jory and I are opening up our retreat in beautiful Costa Rica from September 28th of 2024 to October 5th. Everyone wants fulfilling relationships. The hard part is love is not enough. So many factors can get in the way preventing ongoing connection, intimacy, and aligned growth. All healthy relationships start within. But when we have unresolved stuff, it can easily interfere with those we are seeking to be closest with. Whether you're in a long-term committed partnership or are single and are looking for love, this retreat will guide you in the heroic journey of healing yourself so that you can be open and available to cultivate the fulfilling relationships you desire and deserve. To find out more, visit joryrose.com slash retreats. That's J-O-R-E-E-R-O-S-E dot com slash retreats. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John back with another life-changing episode of the Evolved Caveman podcast. And today I'm really excited to have with me as my guest, Dr. Keith Edwards. And Keith helps transformational leaders make the complex uncomplicated for leadership, learning, equity. His research, writing, and speaking have received national awards and recognition. And what really caught my interest is he the, he's the author of the recent book, Unmasking, Toward Authentic Masculinity, which is based on more than 15 years of research. Keith illuminates men's masking, unmasking, and becoming to help men develop their own authentic masculinity. And even though men as a group have power, individual men often feel powerless. These contradictory experiences contribute to men's hurting, hurting others, and being hurt. Keith shares strategies to help us all better engage the men in our lives with empathy, reach them with compassion, effectively hold them accountable, and help them to become the men they aspire to be. He also co-edited the book, Addressing Sexual Violence in Higher Ed, Education, and co-authored the book on comprehensive sexual violence prevention. And his TEDx talk on preventing sexual violence has been viewed around the world. Keith, how are you doing? And welcome. Thanks for coming here. Uh, I'm doing great. Um, it's, uh, it's a wonderful day, and I'm happy to be here and happy to be in this conversation with you. Been looking forward to this all week long. So thanks for and having me. You already me. got your run in. So nice job. I got my run in. We were talking about this before. I got my run in. It's very warm here today, and uh, I'm still cooking a little bit from that. So <laughs> that's I'm fired up I'm, and ready to I'm go. I'm always cooking. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just me. Yep. So do me a favor and, and start us off just telling us about how you got to this point in your life and mm -hmm. writing a book on masculinity. Like, why the hell masculinity? Um, well, I've been not writing this book for 15 years. And now it's written and it's done and it's out. We'll come back to that. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, one, I've been a man my whole life, I've been a boy or a man my whole life. So I've had that experience my whole life, thought about that, wrestled with that, been confused about that, um, understood that, challenged by that. And um, I think that's been sort of a thread um, really since sort of my whole life. And then thinking about that really kind of thoughtfully in high school and college and really exploring some things. Um, and then when I was doing my uh, PhD, I was exploring many different topics because that's kind of who I am. I like lots of different things. And I kind of settled on men and masculinities because it was just so interesting to me. And the more I learned about it, the more I learned about myself, the more I learned about my dad, the more I learned about my friends, the more I learned about my relationships. And it just kind of continued to open me up and understand. And so I did my dissertation research for my doctorate on college men's identity development. And I asked college men what it meant to them to be a man, how that changed over time, what affected those changes, and engaged in some really in-depth interviews with them about that. And then after my dissertation, I interviewed them five years later, and then five years later, and then five years later, and I'll interview them again here in three years. And so we've kind of had this longitudinal conversation with 10 men who are very different in terms of their identities and in terms of their engagement in college from scholarship athletes to sexual violence prevention educators to trans men to head of the Black Student Organization to fraternity presidents, just all sorts of experiences. 
and all sorts of different identities. And the theme that sort of came from that conversation was um, they all had the same secret, which was unbeknownst to them, which was, I know what everybody expects of me as a man. I'm very clear, right? And, and we talk about that in terms of the man box. Don't cry, be tough, eat meat, drive trucks, don't do this, don't do that. The things that we all know. I know what's expected of me. And then eventually they would sort of look around, even though we were alone in the room, and they would kind of whisper like, but that's not me. And I'm like, oh, well, tell me about that. And they would look around and be like, sometimes I pretend. Or I fake it. They'd be like, yeah. Uh, and the metaphor was uh, that they came to was wearing a mask. Right? And so there's these expectations. I know it comes naturally to all everyone else. But for me, doesn't quite fit because I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too thin. I'm too big. I'm too smart. I'm not smart enough, whatever the case may be. And so I pretend and I put on this mask. And then we talked about the masking and how they do that and the consequences of that and unmasking. And then later in life, we had conversations about how that continued to play out at work and at home and family and having kids and all of these different dynamics. Um, and then uh, the, the later conversations, a different process emerged from masking to unmasking to then becoming, um, which we maybe can circle back to. So yeah. as I said, I, I did that 15 years ago, 18 years now, and I've been wanting to write this book the whole time. So I've been frustrated with myself and a number of New Year's resolutions was write the book with some expletives sh slipped in there. Um, and um, and it, it, the book is is out and available wherever you get your books. Yeah, and, and thank you for sharing that. The, I, one of the things we talked about earlier was this whole idea of the secret that men share, but none of us think we share right. the secret. We think it's secret. my secret. Yeah. And it's and a we, shared it, secret. Yeah. It's, it, that resonates with me from like the age of 12, right? Where I always yeah. felt like a fish out of water in terms of being a young man. And I thought it was just me growing up. And then, right. you know, having worked with men for 25 years, came to realize that every man that I talked to had the same experience at some age, at some level, but generally for the majority of their life, yeah. that I'm a poser, that I'm a fish yeah. out of water that mm -hmm. I don't truly belong. And everybody else, it just comes naturally. Right. Right. Which then increases that distance. What is wrong with me? And one of the things you said is that everyone knows about this man box. Yeah. And I don't think that's true. I think we all know what's expected of us. Right. But I don't right. think we know that it's a socially constructed right. set of expectations and a mask that we wear that we don't know that we're playing a game. Yeah. We're not even aware of the game. Or that it's a game. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've done the man box activity. I first saw Paul Kibble do it, who I understand sort of initiated that. Yeah. And I've done that man box 80s. activity. And what I, um, what I, what the experience of doing that activity is nobody learns anything new, but they have a new way of understanding. Mm hmm. Right. And so I, that really connects with they don't maybe don't know about a man box, but they know don't cry. They know be tough. They know all these things. And then you put it up on the screen and you put the boxes around it and all these things imposing. And it's like, oh, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And I think the, the my participants when they were in college. So I talked with them when they were in college. Um, they really understood what was expected of them as men and then yeah. particularly as college men. And to your point, they, they didn't feel like they measured up, thought everybody else did. And they each sort of like, I have this unique strategy in which I fake it or I perform or I put on this mask. And um, one of the things that sort of emerged later on is sort of looking back is once they sort of had language for this mask through the conversations, they noticed it all the time. Yeah. They noticed it in themselves like, oh, who? Why did I just lie about that? That's yeah. ridiculous. Or why did I pretend I that I cared about that? I slept with 200 women. Yeah. Or why am I lying about how much I drank? Why am I, yeah. uh, why am I lying about not going to class and not buying the book when I definitely did? Yeah. I uh, talked and, to Ashanti Branch about growing up as a young man in Oakland. Yeah. And he was saying that it was social death to reveal how smart you actually were and how good you were doing in school. To be smart. Yeah. 
and I think I think there's some intersections with racism there as well. Mm -hmm. But one of the thing the the key things was that um, college masculinity, as these participants defined it, was partying. That was what yeah. it was expected of college partying, yep. and partying included five very specific things. It was doing drugs, drinking to excess, having competitive heterosexual sex. Mm -hmm not preparing for academics which we just pointed to and then breaking whatever rules which could be swearing being loud in the dining hall whatever yeah stealing golf carts of security oh wait exactly sorry, that what, whatever is a transgression right yeah and i just never made sense of that not preparing like you were talking about college what's expected yeah. of college men is to not prepare and it didn't make sense and and i kept hearing it over and over again and as a qualitative researcher if things don't make sense and you keep hearing them you have to make sense of them right yeah and then it just clicked for me. Every action movie you've ever seen, Rambo, James Bond, Jason Bourne, whatever, the hero knows how to do everything. Yep. He can speak any language. Uh, he can operate any military style weaponry, including those that haven't been invented. He knows every form of martial arts. He can hack any computer system and he never studies. And he's, he's not like on the plane to Serbia learning Rosetta yeah. Stone, right? He just shows yeah. up and can speak the language fluently. And, and, and so I think that speaks to the man is, box. Sorry to interrupt. I think that speaks yeah. to the man box, box rules of be self-reliant and don't ask for help. Right. And that what we learn is it's manly to be successful, mm -hmm. to get an A, to get the promotion. But, not, but if you have to you prepare it's not or cool to study try. or work at it, yeah. something must be wrong with you. Which but, actually is funny because it goes against Carol Dweck's Totally. whole thing on growth versus fixed mindset right so it, it encourages us to have a fixed mindset right this is what i am this is what i'm not really hamstrings and like hamstrings us and when we get to that like i got to that point in calculus in high school where i was like shit i'm not yeah. understanding this like well yeah. i guess that's the end of my math career like i'm just topping out i guess right. that's it for me and then i got you know you kind of get a little bit depressed and a little bit anxious and you back off the material rather than looking for other ways to go after the material and learn it and realizing that everyone gets to that point of struggling yeah. in some material at some point. Well, and I had men telling me stories about studying on the down low. One guy was in his uh, fraternity house in his room and all the other guys say, hey, it's Thursday night. We're going out. We're going out. Come on with us. He's like, no, no, I got this, this girl I've been talking to. And I think I got a real shot at hooking up with her. You all go. Right. And they're like, oh, good luck, whatever. And they leave. And then he studies pulls the book out from underneath his desk and studies because he knows he's not just going to magically know how to do that yeah. chemistry. He's got to work at it, but he's lying about, just think about this. That, that man box is so good that college men are lying about studying for class because it is contradictory to what is expected of them to prove their manhood. Yeah. And I think that happens in high school. I think there's some intersections with race. I think there's there's a lot of other things going on. Another thing that's sort of interesting related to this is some of the men who experience oppression, whether it was black men or Latino men or working class men, felt I don't I know that's what's expected of me. I don't have that luxury. I'm going way in debt. My family's making huge sacrifices. Black men are expected to succeed here, so I know that's expected of me as a man. But I don't have the luxury of proving my manhood by not studying or yeah. stealing golf carts. Cause if I get caught, it's going to be real different than if y'all get caught. Yep. Um, yeah. And I so, don't have the white privilege to rely on. Absolutely. And so there's a, a, the expectations were there, but some men felt like proving their manhood is a privilege. They didn't quite have access yeah. to. Yeah. To what extent do you get into the intersectionality of identities where, you know, let's say I'm a black gay male, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. college student. Yeah. And each of those are separate lenses through which I would view yeah. the world. Right. And, and so to what point do you kind of take that into account? Cause I think that's an interesting uh, theory that I really haven't yeah. spent much time thinking about, but I think it's really important. Yeah. It's really central. Um, and I want to separate out two things that often tend to get conflated multiple identities and intersectionality. So multiple uh, so identities is is black and gay and a man those are multiple identities and then intersectionality is that person experiencing gender privilege racism and homophobia and sort of experiencing these different intersecting forms of power so my my 
10 men, not, not a ton, include four men of color, two gay men, one trans men, working class men, men from wealthy backgrounds. So a lot of these things. Just to, to they, clarify, yep. the trans man is female who transitioned to male? Yes. Okay. So was assigned female at birth, lived their life as a girl, came to college. And when we first did the interviews, was not passing as a man. At because, all. Well, that's fascinating to me, that experience, because I read mm -hmm. a book, I think it's called Athlete, of someone who transitioned in that direction yep. and then got into amateur boxing. But right. the first, I think it was like 25 to 30 years of his life, mm -hmm. grew up female. And so, you know, is exposed to the man box because that's our culture, but yep. grew up as a female in the man box and then became male and now has much more pressure on him to behave like a traditional male. So really yeah. felt the weight of man box only the past, you know, five to 10 years. Yeah. So it's a and, totally and, different experience. Uh, it is. And I also would say it's not. So this participant, when we first did the interviews, um, was, was just recently living their life in this way. And it just started finding and making a transition was not passing most people would interact with this person and assume that they are. A woman. And so he was literally proving his manhood. Yeah. And the other nine participants were figuratively proving their man and doing the same things, swearing, posture, working out like the same things. So their strategies were very similar. Five years later, when I did the five-year follow-up, I did a focus group with some of the men. And um, when he came in the room, I, I literally did not recognize him. I'm like, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong room. We're having this focus group. And wow. he was like, I mean, he had a beard and the whole thing. And there's no way anyone would ever interact with him in any way and have any clue that he was born female or that he was even trans. And he tells a great story um, about working in a small engineering company and there's a new, uh, like 20 people, engineering company, there's a new woman who starts working there. He's on his way to a meeting with some of the other engineers. He stops and says, you know, nice to meet you. Tell me a little bit about you. Just kind of chit-chatting with her. Uh, and then he goes to the meeting. He gets to the meeting and all of his peers are like, oh, we saw you talking to her. You totally want to get with her. You don't want to do that. And he's like, wow, they don't have any idea that I'm gay, let alone trans. They don't know that this is so far from my experience. He sort of has this sort of dual rea reaction of like, wow, we just really don't talk about our personal lives at all. Because he was completely out in his life, both as being gay and as being trans. Mm. And in a computing company, you just don't talk about life outside work, right? Those are yeah. geeks, he would say in his language. Yeah. But he talked about it as they put that mask on him. Right. He wasn't doing that in his interaction with Other her, but they imposed. saw that interaction and they assumed you want to get with her, you want to be with her, like you're you're trying to hook up. Right. So they put that mask on. And and because this was in the focus group, the other men were like, wow, that's really what a unique experience you have as a gay trans man. We can't, you know, wait a minute. <laughs> People put that mask on me all the time. <laughs> and I just assumed they thought I was trying to get with her and I didn't even know it. Yeah. Right. So they, when other people would do that to them, they just thought, oh, you see something I'm not even aware of. And so it was sort of like, oh my gosh. Other, so other, we put the mask on ourselves, both intentionally and consciously, unintentionally and unconsciously, when we only realize that like days later, we're like, what was I doing? And then other people put the mask on us and make assumptions about our choices and our behavior and our decisions. And then media puts it on us as well. Right. So social right. media, movies, TV. Right. With the, the action hero kind of stereotype. Yeah. That socializes and, and us and teaches that's us. That's where I, I think the danger for me really lies is in that unconscious and unintentionally yep. wearing the mask where we yeah. don't even realize it's happening. And so one of the reasons I do this podcast is to try and insert a little bit of daylight or breathing room between self and mask. Yeah. So you have some awareness that this is what's going on. You have some awareness that this is yeah. socially constructed that this is not your fault. You didn't ask to be socialized this way. Right. It is your responsibility, however, to evolve beyond it. Yeah. You got it. Let me tell you a, um, a story, and then I want to come back to the intersectionality. Um, 
Well, let's just go to the intersectionality. Um, my my participants were talking about the multiple masks they wear. So there's the mask, but it's not the only mask. Mm -hmm. So the mask is the dominant culture. It's the man box. It's all the things that we tell all men that we all know. Don't don't cry, be tough, all of those different things. And so all of the men knew that. And then some of them were like, but there's also gay masculinity. And sometimes I have to put on that. And it's it's different. But then there's black masculinity. And sometimes I have to do that. And it's different. And there's Latino masculinity, working masculinity, and rural masculinity, and urban masculinity. And well, there's a all of those are of multiple, too. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say there's a couple types of Latino masculinity. Absolutely. Right? I think it's caballer, black, caballerismo and machismo. Yeah. Not sure about but the first But what black one, but. masculinity is in a rural Alabama is different than yeah. black masculinity in a design firm in LA is different yeah. than black masculinity in a community center in Minneapolis. And the same person, if they go to the south, if they go from LA to the south, that black masculinity may shift and right. adapt and survive. Right. And what if you're a black college man in class with six other black men and a white woman professor, which mask are you wearing now? Yeah. Right. Just in that room, you might engage in this way and then engage yeah. in this way to be black enough for them, not too black for them and navigating that. What happens if it's just not six black men, but what if it's three black men and three black women? Like, And so they yeah. talk about wearing a mask is exhausting and has consequences wearing multiple masks is even more like, and it's not just hard to wear masks, it's which one am I doing now, which one, and, and navigating all that. And so the, that the multiple mask and then intersectionality is, I one of my participants, working class, very poor, Latino, very committed to um, addressing issues facing the Latino community and really being an advocate and getting feedback that he dominates the meetings and cuts women off. So here you have someone facing classism, oppression, racism, but also exerting his power and privilege, mm -hmm. right? And that's intersectionality, navigating multiple dynamics all at once. Yeah, great example. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the terms that you have that mm -hmm. I wanted to get to, sorry to change subject, yeah. is manesthesia. <laughs> what is manesthesia? I have a guess, but please yeah. tell me. Oh, you you know all about it. Uh, so here's here's the story. This is uh, when I asked college men, when was the last time you were really took the mask off, really authentic, really vulnerable? When was the last time you really opened up to someone? And they'll often tell a version of this story. I remember about two or three months ago. It was a long time. <laughs> um, we were all out drinking. About 2.30 in the morning, we all came back. Everybody else left. It was just me and my best friend. We went up to his room. We sat next to each other on the beanbag chairs, and we were blowing up stuff on the screen playing a violent video game. And that's when I told him, my parents are getting a divorce, and I don't know how to feel about that. Or that's when I told him our family dog died and going home for Thanksgiving will be the first time I'll have been in that house without that dog. Now, manesthesia is, think about all the anesthesia it takes to tell your best friend, not some stranger, not some random, but your best friend. One, it's late at night, so we're tired, so our inhibitions are down. Two, we've been drinking which lowers our inhibitions and also gives me an excuse. Cause if you make fun of me tomorrow, I can be like, whatever, dude, I was so wasted. I don't even remember yeah. that. Yeah. Um, we're sitting side by side so we can avoid contact eye contact, which can feel too intimate or can feel aggressive to men. We're blowing things up on a video screen, proving our manhood. Um, and that's the kind of manesthesia it takes for a man to tell his best friend what he's really thinking, what he's really feeling, what he's really struggling with. If it takes all that manesthesia to talk to your best friend, imagine what it takes to talk to your coach or your advisor or your therapist or your mom. Um, yeah, the if I can jump in there, the other yeah. thing I've been hearing from college students over the past, I don't know, five years is big uptick in marijuana usage and cocaine usage in that same mm. example. Mm -hmm. And, but it, it, it does give us an excuse and 
I, I think to me, one of the biggest problems that I have with man box culture is the rule of be stoic. Don't feel right. Because we have no clue how we actually feel. We're not encouraged to go in that direction. We're not encouraged to turn inward. We're not encouraged to learn how to be better in relationship. And then yeah. when we get in a romantic relationship at some point in our lives, assuming heterosexuality, or it could be homosexual, the biggest complaint I hear from women, and women are initiating 75% of the divorces in the US right now, mm -hmm. is I can't connect with my man. Mm -hmm. Well, no shit. Like well, it, he can't again, connect with himself either. <laughs> yeah, not our fault. Like we didn't ask to be socialized like this, but right. it's our responsibility to learn to turn inwards and begin to be curious about these things. Yeah. It's a great point about um, how the way that men are socialized um, affects relationships, uh, affects people who are not men. And the same thing affects us who are men, we our well-being, right? Higher rates of many mental health issues, higher rates of suicide, all of these costs to well-being that we yeah. know about. But it also sacrifices our authenticity and our humanity. So yep. when I'm watching the end of Friday Night Lights, the TV show, and I get teary, and my partner pauses it and said, are you okay? And I pretend I'm not crying. I'm sacrificing my authenticity. I'm mm -hmm. pretending I'm something I'm not. I'm sacrificing my humanity by hiding from her and me my real, genuine, authentic emotions. And I get self-righteous and indignant. And what are you doing? You're ruining the show. And I blink a lot because I think that's going to help. And, it, and if, really you funny about honest, this, if you were honest about those tears, it would bring the two of you closer together. It would. And I know she's not going to make fun of me. There will be yeah. no negative consequences. To your point, there are enormous positive <laughs> affirmations I would receive. And what's hilarious is she knows that I tell this story all the time and I still do it. Yeah. Um, and when my car breaks down and I know nothing about cars, but I open up the hood and look around and mm, <laughs> right. I'm pretending yes. to be something I'm not. So, yeah. the, and, and I think one of the things that, that really, we need to get past is this notion of men versus women, which is a very binary way, yeah. way to think about it. But if, if women are going to gain, men have to give up. But if, you know, if I can jump in there, I think yep. that men versus women paradigm is tremendously supported by man box rule of be competitive. Yeah. It is. And, and, and if we an all just saw too, right? the roots of what are facing women, sexism, and the trouble facing men is the same thing. It's patriarchy, it's gender roles, it's all of these things. And I think that shifts when we start talking about women gaining and men losing. What are men willing to give up so the women can gain? It's the zero sum game. And instead say, listen, patriarchy, gender norms, they're ruining all of our lives. Mm -hmm. It becomes a group project. We're all working together yeah. to help women and trans people break free from oppression. And wouldn't it be great if men could break free from mental health issues and, <laughs> and suicide? And despite all the concrete and real privileges we have in our life, we die younger. Like we lose our authenticity and humanity, our, our relationships and connections, which you're pointing to, but then also just our societal well-being. Yeah. And so I love this notion of group project, collective liberation. How do we all get together to dismantle some of this for all of our freedom? Yeah. And, and along those lines, I'm really careful how I phrase these ideas on air. Mm -hmm. For instance, I never use the phrase toxic masculinity because even when I hear that, I shut down. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Ooh, what did I do wrong? What did I do bad? Yeah. Am I bad? And, you know, so there's certain phrases I stay well away from, yeah. but even like I've used the phrase traditional masculinity. Right. The, and that's triggered some people like, well, yeah. what's traditional masculinity? Like who gets to decide that? I'm like, well, society decided that like yeah. hundreds of years ago. And we're just kind of, you know, reaping the lack of benefits from it now. Right. Um, but yeah, so I've thought a lot about how to communicate these ideas to men so that they can hear it without getting defensive and ideally have the opportunity to take the ideas in and consider them with curiosity Yeah. and without self-judgment. Yeah. And I think when I was, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a nerdy PhD scholar who's written, you know, peer reviewed academic articles. Keith, you are so much more than that. That is just <laughs> one of your masks. Yeah. That seven people read. But I wrote this book for my kid's kindergarten teacher because every year she doesn't know it. 
But every year she gets 15 boys in her classroom who are five years old and she sees what they've learned coming in and she wants them to be great. She loves them in her own very appropriate way. She wants to send them in the world. And I wanted to, this to be helpful to her boys, to therapists, to coaches. And, you know, scholars use the term traditional hegemonic masculinity. That's the sort of scholarly term. But no one understands hegemonic. So I just cut right. that out. So traditional <laughs> means it's similar to what it was 40 years ago. Hegemonic means that it's it's structural, right? M- men are placed related above to power. others, right? Related to power. power hierarchy. And my editor very well said, you got to, you can't use that word. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Like explain what you're talking about. And then, you know, bloggers and educators and activists talk about toxic masculinity and that gets labeled as, you know, men are toxic. Nobody who talks about toxic masculinity seriously thinks men are toxic. We're talking about the expectations on men are toxic. And, you know, that toxicity is what we're talking about. Well, and one of the things, if I can jump in there that helped me to delineate this idea in my own mind is to separate gender from sex. Right. And I'm sure you're aware of this, but, you know, sex is male to female, anything in between on a spectrum. Biological. Um, yeah, thank you. Yep. Gender is masculine to feminine, anywhere in between. And you can social. have, sorry? Social, gender, yeah. gender, thank social, you. yep, sex, biological, Bio, that, and you got the continuum. Yep. Great distinction, yep. thank you. Yep. Um, and then, you know, so you can have a more masculine female or a more feminine male or anywhere in between. And so, right. you know, when you talk about toxic masculinity, it doesn't mean necessarily that we're just talking about men. It's right. about the concept of masculinity and how toxic that is if you subscribe to all the rules yeah. in that man box to the extent that you subscribe well, to all those. And well, there's some good if, and bad in there, but you know, that's kind of right, another discussion. Right. Yeah. And I think even if we don't subscribe to it, we still find ourselves falling into it. Mm-hmm. So there's a, one of my participants is a, a black man working on his job, very involved on campus and addressing issues of racism, very involved in addressing sexual violence, you know, very committed. And one day at his job, he just doesn't feel seen feels like no one will look him in the eye. And he attributes this to racism. And he's just furious and he's fuming and he storms out of his campus job and he's standing at the bus stop waiting and he's just feeling emasculated and he's furious and he's fuming and emasculated by racism. And what does he do in that moment? He hollers at the woman walking by. Comments about her body, comments about sexually harasses her is what Mm. he does. He gets on the bus and he says, what am I doing? So I was feeling emasculated by racism. So I walked out and did something contradictory to my values and did something that reinforces a racist stereotype about black men at the same time. And so to me, it's a great example about that was so far from who he is, but some of that plays out. And I think this leads to something you've been pointing to, um, which my research talked about mask consciousness. Once you know that there's a mask and know that you wear it, and then you start noticing when, and you notice when you do it on purpose, and you notice when you do it unconsciously, then you can then you have mass consciousness. Yeah. And then you start to notice in others. Like, I don't think I've ever seen my uncle without his mask. Like that's so messed up. And oh, I just I, I see you, but then I see, I don't know what that was. That was your mask. They started seeing it in everyone all around them. And sometimes masking is beneficial. Like, I don't think in a job interview, you want to share about how difficult your divorce is and break down sobbing. Right. Right. But so maybe there's a mask to wear, but there's a difference between masking through conscious choice. In this situation, I'm going to make this choice and I'm going to do this because it it will serve me or serve the situation. And then just masking without knowing and having all sorts of uh, consequences along the way. I think that's- Yeah. One of those consequences in your example is Mm -hmm. displacement of anger. Right. Um, right. You know, anger from what you think is racism, which may or may not be, and to catcalling a woman out of right. based out of anger. And it makes me wonder, like, catcalling is one of those phenomenon that I've always scratched my head over. I, like, I really don't see how some how a man thinks that's going to work for them. Like, I've never seen a woman come <laughs> back and say, oh, my God, I love being catcalled yeah. by you and sexually harassed. Here's my yeah. number. Call me. Right, right, right. So I, I, well, it makes me wonder if that's all anger based, just anger at women in general. So I'm no, just going to take I, it out on a random. I see it a little different. One of the things I notice is that I've I've never in my life seen a man who's alone cat call. Makes sense. It is often an interaction not between him and her, but an interaction between him and him. And it's a proof of heterosexuality, which is there right. in by extension a proof of manhood. 
right? So That's let me make this comment directed at her, which can be damaging and harmful, yeah. and then turn to my friends and be like, hey, did you see that? Wasn't that hilarious, right? So, yeah. so I think a lot of it uh, is proving masculinity. I, I want to talk a little bit, if it's okay, about this, because you brought up toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity, healthy masculinity, and then authentic masculinity. Yeah, I want to talk about the process of becoming in your three yeah. stages of masculinity. Yeah. So please. So toxic masculinity, traditional hegemonic masculinity, man box, that's sort of what we all know and we're familiar with. And then there are some folks who want to talk about um, healthy masculinity, which I think makes sense, has a really good place. And that's saying, let's redefine what it means to be a man as being honest and truthful and respected and respectful and all of these sort of positive characteristics. And I think there's a really good place for that to move away from toxic masculinity to healthy masculinity. My worry is that is a maybe a better mask, but it's still a mask. It's still an externally imposed version of what it means to be a healthy man that I now need to fall into. And if, and who's going to decide that, right? I worry about white, upper middle class, well educated men deciding what healthy masculinity and then applying it to men who don't quite fit that. I want to say, let's, let's keep that continuum moving and toward authentic masculinity. And authentic masculinity is what is authentic about being a man or key for me at this point in my life. And some of that man box feels pretty real to me. Like Mm -hmm. I mentioned, you know, eat meat. I eat a lot of meat. I love it. I look forward to it. Like I'm excited about it. That feel that's in the man box. And it also feels authentic to me. But drink beers in that man box for sure. I grew up in rural Wisconsin. I got that message my whole life and I just don't <laughs> like it. And so you know when it's authentic when you're breaking the rules, right? And so for me, my challenge is not what's healthy masculinity and how I perform or wear that mask. But what's authentic for me? And how is that different than what was maybe authentic for me 20 years ago and being here? And your discuss- authentic masculinity is going to be really different than mine. Right. And, and I love the idea that there's not just one authentic masculinity. There's per- potentially millions or billions. Yes, yeah. individual. Individual. Right. And can we talk a little bit about what is in the man box that you find authentic? Because I mean, yeah. like one of the things I find authentic in the man box is be self reliant. But mm-hmm. you have to you have to quantify that or qualify yeah, there's, that. There's a dark because side. If you think of self reliance on a one to ten scale, I don't want to be completely dependent on others or another nor do I want to be at a 10 on that scale where I can't ask for help if I need help. Right, right. So I want to be like at a six or a seven more or less. Yeah. And so I, I think to break down some of those rules in the man box on a one to 10 scale and look at how much of this do I want? Like be the provider. Like I, right. I think that's a fine value, but I've seen right. too many men get way too lost in being the provider and the vast majority of their time and energy and attention go to work and then the very people that they set out to provide for become resentful and bitter and pissed off. Right. Or, or they feel emasculated when their partner makes more than them. Yeah. Right. When that could be great. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, I meet, um, I, I really strive to be respectful and respected. I think some of these things and healthy masculinity. Um, I think it's always a challenge though about, the ways that is authentic for us that fits that traditional expectation that we've been learning our whole life. How do you know? So one of my participants were sort of talking about this secret in the the man box and using some different terms. I just talk about his external expectations. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And he said, so I'm just thinking about this and I love football. I played high school football. I love college football. I love professional football. I love fantasy football. I love football. And I was like, cool. He said, but how do I know if I love football or have I just been taught my whole life? I'm supposed to like football. And I was like, yes, exactly. Like, how do you know? Like you think you love football, but is that authentic and genuine coming from you? Or is that just so well socialized that you think you're like, like, how do you know? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, if I don't know if I like football, I don't know if I like girls. And he was kind of kidding, but kind of not. And I, yeah. I love the notion that once football is up for grabs for men, like everything is up for grabs. Um, but it, I, I think about that often when I think, uh, you know, I like meat. That's part. Do I really? Or have I just been so well socialized my whole yeah. life? And I don't know how you would ever know. 
Um, it, well, it is a little bit of a mind fuck. And, you know, yeah. using the word fuck, I just established my masculinity. So thank <laughs> right, you for the right. opportunity. Cursing, swearing, absolutely part of it. <laughs> but, yep. um, and that's part of the man box that I do like. Um, I mean, let's talk a little bit about competitiveness because that one fascinates mm-hmm. me as well. Like I was a competitive son of a bitch growing up because mm-hmm. that was how I was socialized. I think my parents yeah. really encouraged that. We were high achievers. We competed at high levels in athletics. And I've realized as I've gotten older that competitiveness doesn't really serve us in a lot of areas of life, particularly in our romantic relationship in an argument. Yeah. It's not well, about any winning and losing. Yeah, fair enough. Right. I mean, how many times do you uh, find yourself feeling competitive with your closest friends who are men? Yeah. Over fitness, over Wait, money. Wait, mean there's something, there's something over, else. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think that shows up about, um, that shows up a lot. And so where, where I'm competitive too, where does competitiveness push us to our best selves, right? Whether it's running the race or doing the learning and where does it undermine our best selves? So I think a lot of these things that are there uh, on their face can be neutral. They can be also positive and they can also have a dark side and be yeah. really destructive. And that's what I found with context. most of these rules is they can have a, they're good up to a point, right? but you got to look at what's that point. And, you know, competitiveness, I see it undermining where it undermines connectivity with other human yes. beings. And right. I think it's, it's a really interesting process to look at how competitive am I? Cause a lot of men that I work with are like an 11 on a 10 point scale, you know, they're mm-hmm. D one athletes or pro athletes, mm-hmm. but then they get in a knockdown drag out argument with their spouse or girlfriend. Yeah. And it's like, well, did you realize that you're bringing that same competitiveness right. into your relationship and it's destroying your relationship? I remember someone asked me, how have you learned to communicate around difficult subjects? And I had a good answer and they was like, I don't believe it. And I was like, okay. And I realized that how I learned to communicate around difficult subjects was watching a Republican and a Democrat argue with each other on TV. Hmm. And they just, they belittle each other. They're indignant. They're self-righteous. They don't really engage on the arguments. They, they do that. I'm so good at that. I don't value it. I don't like it. It doesn't, it's not how I want to be. But if we get into a disagreement, I fall right into that dynamic because I watch so much of it when I was learning how to deal with disagreements and I fall into that. Um, you know, do you want to be right or do you want to be effective? Right. Do you want, do you want to win this argument or do you want to connect in the relationship? Do you want to, do you want to be right in the relationship or do you want to learn something so that you can both be better in the relationship going forward? Do you want to compete or do you want to collaborate? I didn't really have a lot of examples of that, (laughs) that other one. Um, You mentioned becoming. Can I just say a little bit about that? Yes, please. Yeah. So becoming is this process later in life. uh, And I think very mathematically is becoming as a function of identity times integrity. And so identity means who am I and who do I aspire to be? And I break that up into, um, and this is great for, for those coaches and therapists, Self-awareness, breaking self-awareness into um, self-discovery and self-creation. Self-discovery being going backward into the past and self-creation being going forward choices. We can come back to that if you want to. And then integrity being, this is who I am and who I aspire to be. I don't always do that, right? I aspire to be honest. I just lied three times this week. Okay, so does that mean I need to lie less? Or do I need to change my self-concept? Maybe I'm not as honest as I wanted to, or I, I feel like I've been told my whole life I'm not a very good listener, so I've just accepted I'm not a very good listener. But lately, I've been hearing that people really do feel listened to by me. So maybe I need to maybe I need to change my self-concept. So I would have thought that identity would come first, like we would get me figured out, and then I would try and do that. Mm-hmm. And what the research taught me is that those that identity and integrity are in conversation. I think of it sort of as a, an infinity, right? Yeah. Where who I am informs what I do, and then that informs then who I am, and then that informs how I rethink how I do it. And they're just kind of always flowing back and forth. And so that's the process of becoming identity times integrity, and then those processes are self-awareness and then self-management. Yeah, like, I love who that. Who am I 
And then how am I doing it being that guy? Yeah. I, I love that explanation. And I, to me, I think of an upward spiral where you've got the same marks on either side of the spiral. So you keep hitting integrity oh. and then, and, and, you know, just, and, but it's, it's an upward spiral. So you're always progressing or evolving. Yeah. Um, and integrity, I think of as acting in accordance with your values. So to be right. aware of your top three, four, five values is critical. And then you can have values that you embody right now in the yeah. present moment. And you can also have values that are aspirational. Right. So like courage, I want to become more courageous or authentic. Right. I want to become more authentic or more honest. Right. And, and so I, I think I kind of divide values up in those two camps, yeah. kind of present and future. Uh, yeah, but I and I think. Your, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I, this is our this is our coaching coming out because every if you say you know do you have core values, everyone in the world says yes. If you say, well, what are they? Like, well, you know, I guess. Uh, well, that's fine, but unless you can rattle them off from memory, you can't use them to make day to day decisions. You can't no, use them to make big decisions. Those right? If you know essential. it's family, hope, love, and commitment, then when the going gets tough, you go, all right. Which one of these, how do they guide? But if you just yeah. go, yeah, of course I have core values. I'm not an immoral person. Of course I have core values. Well, then they can't guide your life. I, well, I and it's, it's funny. I have some clients that I'll give a values exercise to. Yep. Incredibly resistant to doing the exercise. Mm. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, if you, if you put those values down, you might have to really look at them and look at your behavior compared to them. And that's scary as hell. Right. And then, then there's accountability. And accountability is such a key part of this, right? And, and, and you can't, don't get it if you don't say, this is, these are my values or this is my life purpose. Another thing that we all have a life purpose, but if you can't say it from memory, you can't use it to make day to day decisions. And that accountability was such a key part of this becoming because I say I'm this, but I don't always do that. And sometimes I recognize it, I can hold myself accountable. But then sometimes other people recognize it and say, hey, you know, you always say this, but I don't, I don't see that really playing out for you. And then we get defensive. Who do you it, think you are? Or we can yeah, oh, yeah. welcome that. We can yeah. welcome that and say, oh, thank you for pointing that out. I'm growing. I'm learning. If we have that growth mindset, then accountability is a gift. Or if we have that fixed mindset, then it's a threat to be defensive yeah. against and fight back and, and, and resist. I think it's, it's fascinating to me because I'm a big fan of like positive psychology and learning to become mm -hmm. happier. Um, mm -hmm. Same. And I guess I've been amazed at how integral a part of having a happier, thriving life integrity actually is mm -hmm. because I see so many people like talk with so many people that act out of integrity and it creates such yeah. emotional turmoil and pain and suffering. Like, yeah. You know, if someone were to have an affair, right? Like, okay, that's 15 minutes of pleasure, assuming they right. did it. Once. Sounds fun. And it's exciting and I feel yep. desired. Yep. In exchange for years or perhaps a lifetime of guilt and shame and suffering. Right. right. I love uh, Paul Ben Shahar's definition of, of happiness, which is the combination of pleasure and meaning. Yeah, pleasure being fun. the short term sensory tastes pleasure. good, feels good, sex, drugs, sunset, rock and roll, incredible art, amazing. That's yeah. part of it, and then meaning is the long term relationships, purpose, and work. I've made a difference in my life, yeah. and having those together is really great. And, and you me. can do one or the other, and it leads you astray. Let me. We, I, unfortunately, we have to wrap up here in a few yeah. minutes. Um, let me ask you one more thing. Yeah. To what extent? does serving others factor into your happiness? Like I'm trying to look for a better value or yeah. a better meaning in life than that. And I have not found it. I love that you're bringing this up because, uh, you know, I have more than a thousand hours coaching people. And like you were mentioning, you get this behind the scenes view, right? You think it's just me. And then like every client you have yeah. is like, when they really tell you the truth, like every client I have, wants more friends every single one <laughs> and so i feel like i have this behind the scenes view what i another behind the scenes thing that i have learned is that if your if your values and your life purpose don't include serving others they're meaningless that doesn't mean 
you can't focus on yourself. But if the focus on self is because I want to be a millionaire, it's, it's interesting, but it's cheap. If you want to earn a million dollars so you can dedicate your life to, or if you want to earn $5 million so you can give it away to charity, now it has meaning and it has purpose. Um, but when you really get down to it, um, without the serving others, there's no drive, right? It's just, and it's just about self. And when it's just about me, my achievements, my accomplishments, then when things get really hard, you just go, I don't know, maybe it's not worth it. I give up. Yeah. But when it's to um, have increased the forests in the world, then it, then it's, there's a means to an end. Otherwise your day to day, your business this year, whatever you're doing is just, a means. So what's the end? And if you have a really clear end of providing for your family, economic growth, sustainability, helping kids who have heart, who need heart surgery, whatever it is, then that's what sustains us when the going gets tough. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a strong overlap there with spirituality and religion too. Yeah. Uh, right. But I think it's so integral. I just, I keep asking people and getting the same answer. So I'm, yeah, I think we're on to something well, there. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I'm not religious, but I do really feel spiritual. And I think um, the service to others and then connecting that to a spiritual component, whatever that means for you, yeah. maybe just how we're all interconnected. We all breathe the same air. We all share the same God, whatever. Maybe we're all <laughs> the interconnectedness the of all things. I love. Yeah. Lots of different ways to think about that. And, and what's the, what's the little thing you want to do in your life to make a difference? For yeah. Leave the world a better place. Right. Help for the world, out. for people, yeah. for, for however you want to think about that. Um, yeah, that's, that's what sustains people when things get, get rocky. Yeah. And, you know, you were asking at the beginning before we went on air, you know, why do you do the podcast kind of yeah. thing? And my answer is just to serve others. Yeah. Like, it's really simple. It's just to share information in hopes that they can make a better life with the information on this show. Right. And you do men's groups and retreats to serve others yeah, and make dinner. other things possible yeah. and do things like that. And, and same thing, you know, I, I find great meaning in my coaching and my consulting and the speaking, but it's not about me being famous, right? It's about making a difference, about preventing a little bit of sexual violence that's happening yeah. in the world to reducing that to well, we making a difference in this client's life so that they can be more of purpose, so they can be better in their family, so they can be more in integrity. Um, I love that. Well, Keith, thank you so much. This was a yeah. fascinating, powerful conversation. I really appreciate you coming on board. Tell people where they can get a hold of you if they want to know yeah. more. Uh, KeithEdwards.com is the best place to get a hold of me. You can find the book there. You can find me on all the social media channels. You can find my email. Um, what I'd love when you're there is to check out the book for sure, which you can find anywhere you get books. But I have a newsletter called Sharing Fire. You can sign up there. It's 100% free, no pitches, no sales, no nothing. The first Saturday of every month, I share with folks three or four things that I'm learning, three or four things that I'm doing, and three or four things that I'm inspired by. So that often means a, a TED Talk, a blog post, a great article, some of the things I've been doing, and then TV and movie recommendations, a, a beautiful poem, an inspiring thing. Um, so that's just a great way for folks who want to connect to stay connected without any cost or ickiness or any of that. So that sounds great. wonderful. And so Keith, one of the things I've been working on is telling my male friends that I love them. Mm. So just wanted to share, I love you. I really appreciate the work you're doing. If everyone were doing this work, the world yeah. would be a much better place. So thank you. Thank you, John. I, I love you. I love you back. And I love what you're doing and how you're sharing it and uh, keep doing all the great things. Thank you, sir. And that is it for this episode of the Evolved Caveman podcast. If you like this episode, please remember to like, rate, review, and share. If you didn't like it, you don't have to do a damn thing. Thanks so much. I'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 